Good evening, everybody. So good to see you once again on this wonderful Monday. We've had a tremendous time uh, with the Word of God uh, yesterday in Sunday school and Sunday morning and Sunday evening, and we're looking forward to more this evening. Let's all stand. Hymn number 57 at Calvary. Hymn number 57 at Calvary. Years I spent in vanity and pride. I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me, there my burden so found liberty at Calvary. And I learned, bearing up my Lord was through my word, till my guilty sin for in turn to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, hard and there was multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty at Calvary. Verse 4. To salvation's plan, all oh, the grace that brought it down to man, all oh, the mighty God that God did spend at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me, there my burden so far Man, I'm so glad that you can be here tonight. It's wonderful being in the house of the Lord on a Monday evening. Isn't it great? So glad that you're here. And we're uh, looking forward to what the Lord has laid on Brother Swanky's heart for us tonight. Uh, yesterday was tremendous Sunday school, Sunday morning, and, and Sunday night. And I guess about the only negative thing about having three preaching meetings on Sunday is that when it comes to Monday, we're halfway through. Yeah, so uh, it's hard to believe that. But we have tonight and tomorrow night and Wednesday night and... <clears throat> And we're just looking forward to what the Lord has for us. Let's make sure that we, uh, uh, we uh, pay attention, have an open heart, and uh, just make sure that we're sensitive to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. I uh, just wanted to make you aware of a prayer request. Let's be praying for Miss Charlene. Uh, just a, a, a few days ago, Miss Charlene fell, and um, she uh, uh, did some pretty good uh, damage to her leg. And so uh, they, Pastor Bob took her uh, to actually to the emergency room yesterday, and, and so they... Uh, ran some tests and everything seems to be okay, but they're just waiting on some results of things too. But uh, she's in some pain, so just be praying for her. Um, and I know that they appreciate that. Okay, so um, is that, um, I was gonna say one other thing and I forgot what it was. I'm not supposed to be doing that already. <laughs> Okay, well, let's, uh, let's pray so I, I don't forget anything else, all right? Let's have prayer. Our Father, we are so thankful for your love for us and your goodness to us. And, and Lord, we do uh, right now want to think of Miss Charlene, that you just uh, minister healing to her body. And uh, Lord, I pray that you'd give doctors wisdom uh, that as they, uh, as they uh, attempt to figure out exactly uh, what's going on with her, with her leg. And uh, Lord, that you just... Uh, Help her to have a full recovery from this. And Lord, we do thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. I pray that we would share the sentiment of the psalmist that said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And I pray that, again, our hearts would be open, would be receptive. And Lord, I pray that you would just help us to um, be quick to respond to the, the prompting of the Spirit. And, and Lord, as your word is preached tonight, I pray that uh, where we need to hear conviction, that uh, we would listen. And where we need encouragement, uh, that uh, we'd be encouraged, and we'll give you the glory for how you choose to use the service tonight and the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated.
I stand redeemed because of what Jesus Christ did on Calvary's cross. Thank you, choir, for singing that wonderful song. Hymn number 311. We're going to sing about being redeemed. Hymn number 311. Grab that hymn book and let's all stand redeemed. How I love to proclaim it. We're going to sing a verse and chorus, and then we'll go around and shake some hands. Here we go. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through his infinite mercy. This child of forever I am Redeemed, redeemed Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb Redeemed, redeemed This child of forever I am Let's go around let's make everyone feel extremely welcome this evening
God as we head back to our seats. Verse 2 of this wonderful hymn, 311 Redeem. Redeem and so happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence. see in his beauty the king in whose law I delight who lovingly guardeth my footstep and giveth me songs in the night redeem 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 by the blood of the lamb redeem redeem his child and forever I am turn over to him Number 337, showers of blessings. This is the promise of love. Hymn number 335. Oh, there shall be showers of blessings. And this is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing. Sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessings. are falling, but for the showers we plead, verse 2, and there shall be showers of blessing, precious reviving again, over the hills and the valley, sound of abundance of rain, showers of blessings, showers of blessings we need, mercy just round us are falling, Showers, we plead. Verse 4, I'm going to have the trio come up right here. Verse 4 of this wonderful hymn. Here we go. There shall be showers of blessing. Oh, that today they might fall. Now is to God we're confessing. Now is on Jesus we call. Showers of blessings. Showers of blessings we need. Mercy just round us are falling. Like Daniel, let me stand like Paul. Let me pray like Jesus. Let me give my life for you. When the rest have turned and gone, and I'm standing all alone, Lord, let these words be what I say to you. I choose to fight. I choose the right. I choose. Take a stand like those gone on before. No doubt I'll win. Christ will defend. There's no turning back until I reach that shore. I choose the shine to those still lost in sin. So I press toward the prize with a gleam in my eyes, and this my cry until I reach the end. I reach the end. I choose to fight. I choose the right. I choose to take a stand like those gone on before. No 
Thank you so much. Let me invite you to open your Bible tonight to the book of Judges in chapter number 16. Judges chapter number 16 tonight. I'd like to begin reading in verse number 18. And what a wonderful night to be with God's people in God's house. Thank you, choir, as a, a, a favorite song. Of course, I stand redeemed. And aren't you thankful tonight that we don't stand in the righteousness of our own? We don't stand in the glory of a church. That we don't stand in the name of religion, but we stand redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Our first plea, our last plea, it's our only plea, that Jesus shed his blood for you and he shed his blood for me. What a great Savior is Jesus, my Lord. God bless you tonight. You have your Bible, the Judges chapter 16. When we come to Judges chapter 16, of course, we are jumping in the end of the Samson story in the Bible. And might I say, there, there are two ideas that most people, I think, have about Samson uh, that need to be corrected. First, if you go to Mr. Google or Miss Google or whoever runs Google and, and you type in the name Samson and you look at the pictures and the images, you'll see the world's view of Samson. You'll see this mangy looking guy with a wild hairdo that goes all over the place. Now, it is very true, of course, that Samson had long hair, but it is also true, in the, according to the Bible, that Samson was not some wild looking guy. I mean, the Word of God tells us that Samson's hair was braided, it was in locks. And, and, and you know, if there's one thing I, I do believe reading the Samson story, is if there was one person that Samson loved, his name was Samson. I, I think Samson was one of those guys that kind of talked about himself in the third person, you know? And, and if there's anybody in the Bible like Samson, I, I think the closest would be Absalom. And of course, the Absaloms and the Samsons of the world, they may, they may love and be proud of their long hair, but you can be sure that hair was braided. You can be sure that hair was kept. Samson was the kind of guy that was in love with his looks. So when the world thinks there's this crazy, mangy-looking guy, no, the Bible tells that his hair was in locks. You know, the second idea that people have about Samson that is dead wrong is that they picture Samson as being this massive Charles Atlas guy. You know, somebody like Vinny got caught in a gym too long and, and, and somebody with muscles on their muscles, you know, some incredible Hulk guy. Hey, could I just say, number one, I don't care how long you work out in the gym, you're still not picking up the city gates and carrying them 36 miles. I got to tell you, I don't care what P90 Peloton or anything else you do, nope, you're not carrying city gates 36 miles. But you know, the thing about Samson, it really is the stunning thing, is that there's no reason to believe that he had muscles piled on top of his muscles. In fact, quite certainly the opposite is true. You say, well, how do you know that? Because in the first part of Judges chapter 16, the five lords of the Philistines, the governors, the government officials, they're looking at Samson saying, what is the secret of his strength? 
You know, if this guy was some Charles Atlas walking around with massive muscles, then you wouldn't have to ask what is the secret of his strength. Certainly you would know right away. But no, no, when somebody looked at Samson, they're shaking their heads saying, how does this guy do this? What is the secret of his strength? It, they were so desperate that in Judges chapter 16, they paid Delilah, and, and, and this is how the numbers work, the equivalent of $27 million to find the secret of his strength. Now look, I know that government officials are real good at wasting somebody else's money, but there's a limit even to that. $27 million. Hey, I'll tell you, if you could look at Samson and say, well, that guy works out like nobody else. That guy's got muscles that nobody else has. If you could look at Samson and realize that, nobody'd have to pay $27 million to find the secret. No, the stunning thing about Samson is, and why should we be surprised, Hollywood gets it wrong. One more time, Hollywood gets it all wrong. Samson is not a wild-looking man, nor is Samson some guy with muscles piled on top of his muscles. But you know, it doesn't make the story of Judges chapter 16 less heartbreaking. Because when we come to this chapter, all you can do and all I can do is shake our head, and all we can do is say, what happened, Samson? How could one man who had so much going for him. How could one man that had so much blessing from God find a way to throw it all away? It is the story of an incredibly wasted life. If you're able physically tonight, could I invite you to stand together with me as we go to Judges 16 and verse number 18. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he has showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hand, and she made him sleep upon her knees. And she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. She began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. Father, as we open the Bible, we ask tonight that you do a mighty work in this place. I pray for men, ladies, especially pray for young people in this room tonight that the word of God would sound the alarm. Lord, help us, remind us yet again that sin will always take us further than we want to go and make us pay a price we don't want to pay. Lord, that great conviction would fall upon this auditorium tonight. We pray in the strong name of Jesus, my Savior. Amen. Thank you so much. Please be seated. On May the 18th, 1993, the President of the United States needed a haircut. Now, I suppose that's not such a big deal because presidents need haircuts. I would say our president one really needs one, but, but uh, that's just one guy's opinion. However, in 1993, the problem wasn't so much that President Clinton needed a haircut. The bigger problem that day was where he got his haircut. Mr. Clinton was on the great presidential plane, Air Force One. It was on the ground on the tarmac at Los Angeles International Airport, and that's where Mr. Clinton got his hair cut. Now, understand, you know, I enjoy flying. I do it frequently. But the one thing you don't want to get anywhere near is an airport when the President of the United States is in vicinity. I mean, as soon as Air Force One is in the air, there's a ground stop. Nothing's landing. Nothing's taking off. If the President is on his plane at the airport, the entire thing just shuts down. So when Mr. Clinton decided to get a haircut in 1993, sitting aboard the presidential plane, Air Force One, uh, unfortunately, Los Angeles International, quite the airport, was shut down. I mean, there were planes that had to divert to different airports. There were people that missed connecting flights. There were people that didn't get home for dinner that night. It turned into a real disaster because President Clinton uh, got a, a haircut on board that plane. But you know, to make matters worse, it's not just where he got his haircut, it was who he got it from. Mr. Clinton invited, <clears throat> excuse me now, Christoph of Beverly Hills. That's just going to be a problem. Sorry, but when a guy gets a haircut, he needs to go to an old guy, an old guy that's got a one-syllable name. You understand what I mean? You got to get a haircut from a Sam, a Bill, a Hal. As soon as it starts getting into two syllables, you're going to have a problem. And when it's Christoph of Beverly Hills who's coming to style the president's hair, needless to say, this isn't going to turn out well. And you know, that day when Christoph of Beverly Hills was finally done styling the 
president's heir, he handed Mr. Clinton a bill for $200. That'd even be a lot now, let alone back in 1993. But you know, if that was the only bill that President Clinton got that day, that would have been small for sure. Unfortunately, when the news media discovered uh, that the airport was shut down because Kristoff of Beverly Hills was styling President Clinton's hair, it just became a news story that didn't seem to stop. A newspaper in Washington, D.C., the Washington Post, wanted to rename the presidential plane. They wanted to call it Hair Force One. Another newspaper, the Boston Herald out of Boston, said that President Clinton just got the most expensive haircut since Samson. And you know, that's something that Samson and President Clinton had in common. They both know what it means to pay too much for a haircut. Come to think of it, they may have something else in common too, but <laughs> what can I tell you? See, you can get away with that in Medford, Oregon, you know? I can't do that in like Salem or Portland, but it works down here, doesn't it? <laughs> and it doesn't work in any part of California, I can promise you that. But you understand, that day President Clinton got a bill, and in Judges chapter 16, the Bible tells us Samson's about ready to get a bill for his haircut. And the Bible tells us in 19 that she made him sleep upon her knees, and she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. Well, now the Bible tells us with Samson asleep on the, on the lap of Delilah, she calls for a man, not even a barber. It was easy enough just to come and cut those braids off and cut those locks off. You know, some have guessed that, why, well, perhaps she poisoned him. That's perhaps the reason that he was sleeping. But, but, you know, in the Word of God, God is more than able to put a man into a deep sleep if that's what it takes for his will to be done. And when we come to Judges chapter 16, we're reading the story of a man that has gone one step too far, and now the God of the Bible is turned against him. And that day the Bible tells us Samson's hair was gone. And when the hair was cut, the Word of God tells us she began began to afflict him. You know, there's not much good you can say about the Delilahs of the world, but one thing I do have to admit tonight, at least she was honest. I mean, if you go back to verse number six, Delilah said to Samson, tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound, and here's the reason, to afflict thee. There's nothing hidden in chapter six. Why, for all the games that Samson may have been playing, and for all the self-deception Samson may have done, when it comes to Delilah, she's about as honest as she could be. Hey, Samson, you're here because we want to know where your great strength comes from. Samson, what the Philistine people want to do uh, is afflict you. We want to torment you and abuse you. Uh, and now, sure enough, a few verses later, the Bible tells us for all the games uh, and for all of the things Samson convinces himself of, now the Bible tells us he's at the mercy of Delilah, and they begin to afflict him. Like Mr. Clinton, Samson's getting a bill for the haircut. Like Mr. Clinton, Samson's going to pay a price that he doesn't want to pay. No, when the bill comes due for Samson's haircut, it's going to cost him a whole lot more than he ever thought because the old southern preacher had it right. He said, sin will always take you further than you want to go. Sin will always make you pay a price that you don't want to pay. Why, the old devil makes it look so attractive tonight, doesn't he? He's got a way, like that preacher said, of polishing the apple and, and making it look so shiny and making it looks so good. Uh, but that old preacher said every time you take a bite out of one of Satan's apples, there's always a worm inside. Why sin can look awfully fun and sin can look awfully attractive and why sin can make itself appear to be something we can handle. But it doesn't matter if someone's name is Samson. It doesn't matter if it's you. It doesn't matter if it's me. For every single one of us tonight, should we choose to play a game with sin, we're going to find out that at the end of the day, when the bill comes due, there's a price we don't want to pay. Samson, it's time to pay for the haircut. So tonight, would you take your Bible, please? And, and from Judges chapter 16, can I show you, please, what it cost Samson when he got his haircut? Notice, number one, Samson gets the bill, and it cost him his strength. In verse 19, she made him sleep upon her knees, and she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head, and she began to afflict him. And the Bible says that his strength went from him. The hair is gone, so the Bible says his strength went from him. Now, right about here, it's a good thing to stop in the Samson story and be reminded what is the secret of his strength. 
Because I'm quite convinced that most people think that there was some kind of connection between Samson's hair follicles and his biceps. That somehow the longer his hair came, the bigger his biceps became. But you know, that's a ridiculous thing. And it certainly is not what the Word of God teaches. No, there is a reason that Samson was powerful. There is a reason that Samson was strong. And, and while it kind of halfway had something to do with his long hair, it wasn't as if there was a connection between his hair and his arms. To understand what's happening here, you have to go back to a moment before Samson was even born. It is one of those powerful occasions in the Old Testament where the Lord Jesus Christ takes on human form and the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament comes and visits a human. I believe the number's 15 times where the Lord Jesus Christ comes in the Old Testament, takes human form and deals with another human. And you know, when you study those in your Bible, it's really stunning because certainly the angel, the Lord, the Lord Jesus, well, he comes to the people you'd suspect. Why, the Abrahams, he comes to the Daniels, those kinds of people. But you know, he also comes to people you'd least suspect, people like Hagar. And now in Judges, the Word of God tells us that the Lord Jesus, the angel of the Lord, makes an appearance. And what do you know? He talks to a woman that we don't even know her name. She is going to be the mother of Samson. And the Lord Jesus said, you're going to have a son. Interesting, the prophecy went like this. Not he is going to deliver Israel. The Lord said he would begin to deliver Israel. You're going to have a son, but this is the key now. The Lord Jesus said your son is going to be a Nazarite from his birth. In the Word of God, there are three men that took what was called the Nazarite vow for their entire life. There is Samson, Samuel, and John the Baptist. Now, Nazarites, people took a Nazarite vow, are, are people that had three great convictions that had to be true in their life. Sometimes people would say, I need personal revival in my life. I need to come apart from the world and get along with the Lord. And, and they might take a Nazarite vow for a week, maybe more likely for a month. But there were three people that God said for your lives, I want you to be separated unto me. Now, if you were a Nazarite, or if you took the Nazarite vow more accurately, there were three things, and there are kind of a few more technicalities, but there were three big things you had to determine. Number one, if you took the vow of the Nazarite, yet under no circumstances do you ever touch a dead body. All right, don't touch a dead body. Thou shalt not. How hard is that? Number two, if you take the vow of the Nazarite, you don't get involved in liquor. You don't even go to the vineyard. You stay away from grapes. I mean, anything that has anything to remotely do with liquor, you stay away from it. And number three, if you've taken the vow of the Nazarite, you don't cut your hair. Now, and I love when people say, oh, the Bible's so complicated. Really? What part, of the, what part of thou shalt not is so complicated? Uh, God said thou shalt not. Now you're a Nazarite. So there are three simple things. You don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar to understand this. All you have to do is understand that God has some commandments for Nazarites. And God said if you're going to take this vow, then number one, you don't touch a dead body. Then number two, you get, stay away from liquor. And number three, you don't get your hair cut. All right, so we follow the Samson story in the Word of God. And the first we read of him, now he's a, a young man about ready to get married. And the Word of God tells us that he crosses over a little creek, a little, a little area, goes about five miles from Israelite territory, and he finds himself in a little place called Timnath, a little village. There the Bible tells us that, that Samson is going to meet a young lady. Now, as Samson makes his way, the Bible tells us, and, and you know, for anything else, I mean, you know, it's, I mean, there's part of you that really wants to get mad at Samson, saying, man, how dumb can one guy be? And there's part of you that shakes your head, and you just want to yell at the guy and slap him around, saying, man, how could one guy with so much... But there's another party that just has to laugh and say, there's just something great about this guy. I, I mean, there's just, there's just both sides of this. And sure enough, as Samson's coming along, what do you know? A lion pounces at Samson. Now, there were a lot of rules for Nazarites, but if a lion is jumping out at you, you can defend yourself from the lion. And sure enough, Samson takes that old lion in his bare hands and he rips the thing right in two. It's just a beautiful thing, you know. I mean, the PETA people would hate Samson. So I don't know what you think, but I just like him just for that, if nothing else. And so now you got this dead lion ripped in two on the side of the road. Beautiful. Oh, a few days later, Samson comes by and, and there's that dead lion. It's still there. And you know, I, I don't know what you'd think, but I, I guess 
guess if you had to say something, you would expect the Bible to say the lion was covered with maggots and flies. But instead the bees took over and inside the carcass of the lion there was honey. So Samson walks up to the lion and he looks in there and he sees the honey in the carcass of the lion. And, and I don't know the thought process, but as I mentioned before, I, I just kind of think that Samson's the kind of guy who talks about himself in the third person. So I can look at Samson, you know, I can see him walk up to this lion and say, Samson is hungry. And when Samson is hungry, Samson's going to eat. And, and ringing in the back of his mind, you know, is the, the command of God, thou shalt not touch the dead body, but hey, Samson's hungry. And when Samson's hungry, Samson's going to eat, and Samson's going to eat right now. And you can see old Samson lean down and scoop the honey right out of the carcass of the lion, and he starts eating. And, and the Bible tells us he took some more for mom and dad. He gave some to them. Coincidentally enough, he told, wouldn't tell them where it came from. Now, that's stunning, isn't it? God just said, don't touch a dead body. How hard is that? Don't. And Samson says, well, I don't care what God says. I am hungry. And if Samson's hungry, Samson's going to eat. And if touching a dead lion and scooping out the honey is where lunch comes from, well, too bad for the Bible. Too bad for God. Now, I, I know that, you know, he's saying, I just ate not too long ago. And that just kind of sign, sounds kind of gross, you know, reaching into a dead lion and scooping out the honey. And, and maybe so. But Samson may stand here tonight and say, well, you know, I eat honey out of the carcass of a lion, but you all go to McDonald's, so what's the difference, you know? I don't know, and, and, and I don't know how Samson figured it out, but, but whatever, God said, don't touch the dead lion. And Samson said, tough, I'm hungry. And when Samson reaches down and scoops the honey out of, the, out of that carcass, look, I don't know if the Lord's a baseball fan or not, but if he is, I'm certain he's not a Mariners fan. That's what I can guarantee you or A's fan, or whatever you all are here. <laughs> but you can almost see the Lord watch Samson reach down and scoop the honey out of that dead carcass, and you can hear the Lord say, stay right one. All right, that's just strike one. Nobody strikes out in strike one. What did God say? Don't get involved in liquor. All right, so a few minutes later, or a few days later, I should say, Samson's got a, a disaster started. It's a catastrophe, and, and, and just because of Samson lust, World War III or IV or whatever the number would have been back then is about ready to break out. I mean, they got the Philistines fighting the Israelites. An entire war is starting all over Samson. And, and now Samson's got this woman he wants to get married to, and he goes back to Philistine territory. He said, I'm going to take her to wife. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that before they're going to get married, Samson throws what you and I would think of in America as a bachelor's party. The Bible says Samson made there a feast. It's a very unique word in the Old Testament because we might read the word feast and picture a Thanksgiving feast. That's not the word. The word means to throw a wild drinking party. So Samson's going to get married. Samson throws a party for himself. Samson invites a bunch of guys and they have a wild drinking party. A little bit later, Samson finds himself back in the vineyards where he's not supposed to be. But what did God say? God said, don't get anywhere near a vineyard. Don't drink wine. Don't drink. Don't do it. And you know the reason the Bible gives, the reason Samson throws a wild drinking party, here's how it goes, for so used the young men to do. Everybody else gets to have a party, so Samson gets to have a party. Everybody else gets to have fun, Samson gets to have fun. And now you can see Samson throwing this wild drinking party, and we can almost hear heaven shake its head, and the Lord says, stay right to. So when we come to Judges chapter 16, while Hollywood wants to find a way that, well, his hair was gone, so now his strength was gone, that's not the point. What happens in Judges chapter 16 is Samson strikes out. What happens in Judges chapter 16 is God said, you don't touch a dead body, and he did that. God says, you stay away from liquor, and he violates that. And the last thing, God says, you don't get your hair cut. And with Delilah coming down on him and pressuring him, finally Samson tells her the story and asleep on the lap of Delilah, those locks of his hair are gone. It wasn't so much that he got his hair cut as much as Samson struck out. And now Samson wakes up 
and he discovers that his strength is gone. Samson's getting his bill for his haircut, and when it's time to pay the price, it's a price he doesn't want to pay. It's going to take him further than he ever wanted to go. He never believed it could happen to him, but sure enough, when Samson gets the bill for his haircut, it cost him his strength, because in verse number 20, there's a second thing it cost him. She said, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson, and he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as other times before and shake myself. You know, that to me is the saddest thing in the whole Samson story. And believe me, there are a lot of things that are sad in the Samson story. But you know, with the hair gone, Samson just thinks, well, it's just going to be like all the other times. I'll go out and shake myself loose. I'll go do something big. And Samson, well, I guess Samson had heard his favorite singer tell him that he's just there all the time. And Samson's about ready to discover that he's not just there all the time. That may sell CDs, but that, the Bible never says that. I know our populist world that has its populist religion uh, that loves to say, I can do what I want, live like I want, but when I've made a mess of my life and my life is full of brokenness and broken dreams, that's when I'll just snap my fingers and the Lord's going to come down and fix all my problems. And, and I get it that modern religion has convinced people that the Lord is just there all the time, twiddling his thumbs, waiting in line, waiting for you and I to pull out our phones and schedule him in for an appointment. But Samson's going to learn the hard way that the Lord's not there all the time. Because at the end of verse number 20, he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. Samson, you're getting the bill for the haircut. How's this working? Number one, it cost him his strength because, number two, it cost him the presence of the Lord. You see, the secret of Samson's strength was not his hair. When you carefully read the story of Samson in the Bible, when, when that lion pounces on Samson, when Samson takes the jawbone of, of an ass and slays a thousand men, when Samson picks up the city gates, when Samson ties the tail of the foxes together, and even at the end of Samson's life, every time there is a miracle, every time there is a mighty work, you will read the phrase, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. The secret of his strength was not his muscles. The secret of the strength was the Spirit of God. And now Samson didn't even realize that the Lord was gone. God said three things, Samson, and when Samson struck out, Samson's strength was gone because the Lord was gone. And Samson's getting a bill for the haircut. He's discovering things are awfully lonely right now because the least of his problem is that his strength is gone. The biggest of his problems is that the Spirit of the Lord is gone. Samson's getting a bill for the haircut haircut, and it's going to take him a whole lot further than he ever wanted to go. Notice it not only cost him the presence of God, number three, it cost him his eyes. In verse 21, the Philistines took him and, and put out his eyes, and I get it that that sounds awfully gruesome to us, and, and, and in our spit-shining way of fighting wars, that's just a brutal thing, but, but understand in Bible times, it's just how you fought a war. When an enemy conquered a city, most likely they didn't have enough people to, to stay there as an occupying force, and there was always the worry, we just conquered that city, so what's going to keep that city from from coming back at us, and, and as horrific as this might be and seem to you and me, in Bible times, in Old Testament times, the conquering city would take the men, the young men, the elderly men, and they usually would cut off their hand. Sometimes they might cut off a foot, but when they cut off a, a, a member of the body, they realize that now we don't have to worry about that army coming back at us. There are no hands. There's no feet. They're not going to come fight a war with us. It is just how you did it. And, and you know, when you study the history of wars in the Old Testament, what we read in verse number 21 is a very unusual thing. I mean, it's, it's not the normal thing. Nobody else ever did this, at least as known. Normally, you'd cut off a hand. Maybe you'd cut off a foot, but the, Samsa, but the Philistines took Samson, and the Bible says they, they took out his eyes. What a stunning thing. And as we read in verse 21, and we watch the Philistines take him and, and put out his eyes, we are reminded that the Word of God tells us repeatedly, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You would expect it to read, they cut off his hand, they cut off a foot, but no, they took out his eyes, and yet why should we be surprised? The first time we read about Samson in the Bible, do you know what it says? It tells us how Samson left his homeland, crossed the little creek, went five or six miles in the Philistine territory to a little village called Timnath, and the Bible tells us that he saw a woman in Timnath. 
Soon he goes home to his father, and you know what he says? I have seen a woman in Timnath. Get her for me. Excuse me, Samson, what's her name? I don't know. Well, Samson, what's her family like? Well, I don't know. Well, Samson, let's ask the important question. Can she cook? <laughs> I don't know. But Samson says, I see her. I want her. Get her to me. And you know, that becomes the story of Samson's life. It is the story of a man who is living by the lust of his eyes. I see her, I want her, get her to me. I see it, I want it, get it for me. The same story seems to repeat itself. A chapter or two later, he goes to a place called Gaza. This time he's not five miles over the border. This time he's 30, 35 miles over the border. And the Bible tells us, what do you know? He went to Gaza and after two chapters of disaster, after two chapters where he virtually starts a war after two chapters where both sides are against him after two sides where his life is ready to fall apart you would think that Samson would be smart enough to learn the lesson but the light bulbs never seem to go on do they and then it says Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot it's the story of his life. It's what the New Testament calls the lust of the eyes. Samson says, I see her, I want her. I see it, I want it. What I see is what I want. Samson spends his life fulfilling the lust of his eyes. So why should we be surprised then that when it comes time to pay for the haircut, when the God of the Bible is ready to bring judgment in the life of Samson, it's not a hand, it's not a foot, but those eyes that cause so much trouble, those eyes that were the gods of Samson's life, I see See her. I want it. Get it for me. Now those eyes are gone. And Samson's learning the hard way. You're going to get a bill that you don't want to pay. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. What a reminder that sin, sin always causes somebody to pay a price in their body. Oh, for all the lies of Hollywood, you follow the Hollywood acts of immorality. And when the morals or the and the lack of morals take hold of a life. It is the same story every time. A story of a broken man, the story of a broken woman, a story of a broken marriage, the story of a broken family. It's a story of heartache and sin. Hollywood's morals bring destruction every time it's tried. Oh, go ahead, drink the devil's liquor. And for all the modern houses of religion that are so proud of the newfound freedom they have to drink booze, and for all the modern ministers that promote their alcohol every time it's tried booze does nothing but ruin lives and ruin homes I booze will booze will destroy somebody's ability to think I booze will take a young man and ruin his life booze will take a lady and make her fearful booze will take a man and turn him into a violent man I liquor has never built a family but it's ripped so many apart I liquor has never taken a young person and given them a future but it's put more in jail and in a graveyard than anything else how the judgment of God is upon those who make liquor sell liquor and serve liquor right. and yet Hollywood says and our world says you can get away with your sin you'll pay a price every time oh I know our culture is so bent on let's just see if we can't get as many people smoking pot as is humanly possible you know I, I'm not exactly sure I, well I think I know what America needs but I'm also sure I know what America don't doesn't need and you know, the one thing we don't need in America are more drug addicts. We really don't. We just really don't. And I know that may be kind of shocking, but the last thing we need are more people that are drug addicts. And yet all across the land, it's not just California, it's not just Oregon. I mean, state after state can't get out of its way fast enough. I see if we can't get more young people smoking pot. I see if we can't get more young people destroyed by drugs. And all it does is dull the senses and ruin the flesh. If it's not tobacco destroying lungs, if it's not the pot ruining the minds, if it's not booze destroying the ability to think, if it's not Hollywood's immorality destroying lives, when are we going to wake up and discover that every time the price tag comes for sin, it's always higher than we want to pay? Samson's going to learn the hard way as his eyes are taken out. This isn't what I had in mind when I met the Lila. Sin will take you further than you want to go.
So for Samson, it cost him his strength because it cost him the presence of the Lord. When the bill comes due, it cost him his eyes. Notice in verse 21, it also cost him respect, his self-respect. It says, the Philistines brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. Notice the Bible says they bound him with fetters, plural, very unusual. In Bible times, usually just a rope around the wrist would be all it would take. But you know, the Philistines had gone down that road before. They said, this time we're going to make sure he's not getting away. So it's not just one fetter. There are more than one. Perhaps they doubled up around his wrist. Perhaps that means there were fetters around his wrist and fetters around his ankles. Not only that, where you would expect there to be fetters made out of rope. Nope. The Bible says they were fetters that were made out of brass. Samson's not getting away this time. He's not right across the border where his brothers can rescue him now. He is deep in the Philistine territory. And isn't it, isn't it powerful that at the end of verse 21, he did grind in the prison house. And there comes that drumbeat again that's found throughout the Word of God. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You go back in Samson's life and he was a little bit upset with these Philistine people. So the Bible tells us that he gathered the foxes together. One more time, doing his best to, to get the PETA people to hate him. What a guy. And you know, the only way this story could be better is if instead of foxes, he had cats. <laughs> Pastor Reed told me to say that. And Samson takes the foxes and he tires, ties the tails together and, and then he puts the, the, the fire brand, the torch in the tail and, and the next thing you know, he burns down their fields at harvest season. Samson was the guy that just destroyed their crops. Now, we don't appreciate that maybe in America, but just about 100% of the people were living for the agriculture. It's how you live through the year. And now their harvest was burned down. That guy just burned down our harvest. We don't even know how we're going to eat for the next six months. It was Samson that took care of their fields. Isn't it just a little bit interesting that when everything comes full cycle, that what they do with Samson is they put him in the prison house and they say, you're going to be the grinder. You're going to be the guy who walks in a circle all day long. And you're you're going to make those massive wheels grind the grain. The guy who destroyed their harvest is now the one who's making their bread. That job would usually be reserved for a donkey. It was usually some dumb animal that would walk in a circle all day. And Samson now has been reduced to the job of a donkey. You talk about disrespect. You talk about disgrace. Here is a man that everywhere you look is living in the sin of pride. So arrogant, so proud of who he is, proud of how he looks, proud of what he has done. And now Samson's discovered that when payday comes for sin, of course it does. It brings him down into the prison house and it turns him in. He may well have been a, a mule or a donkey. It's always the ways with sin, isn't it? I mean, you come to my home city of Phoenix, I can come to your hometown of Medford, and it really doesn't matter. But everywhere you seem to look, there are people on the streets for all the good that sin can produce. And I know we get a different, different view from our culture, but the truth of the matter is you ask any police officer, it's the end result of a life given to booze, the end result of a life given to drugs, and the people that live on our streets freezing night after night. And so many people's lives have been ruined. They've been brought to the place of disrespect and shame and disgrace. How oh, sin is such a builder of shame. How many men, once proud men, have been disgraced and shamed for all the good that sin can do. And when the price tag comes for Samson's haircut, this once proud man couldn't be more disgraced and more shamed. There's just a one more thing left, isn't there? I mean, when the bill comes due, Samson's lost his strength and he's lost the presence of God. He's lost his eyes. He's lost his respect. So in verse number 30, he's going to lose his life. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Those are the crowning words of Samson's life. This man that could have done so much, this man that could have accomplished such great things, the last thing you read in the Bible is Samson saying, let me die with the Philistines. You know how God allowed his hair to grow and God gave him that one last opportunity. A little boy was leading him now and brought him into that massive house where thousands of people had gathered to praise the idol Dagon. The five lords of the Philistines, the government officials were there. You know, I can well imagine the liberal seminary professor back in Samson's day 
day, saying, yep, we have that prophecy from Jesus. The angel of the Lord told us that Samson was going to begin to deliver Israel. Well, that hasn't happened yet. And there's Samson down in that prison house, and he's going to die. It's interesting, God never said Samson would deliver him. He said he'd begin to deliver him. And do you know when he began to deliver Israel? With the very last thing he did in his life. He literally brought that house down and the five lords, the government officials, in other words, the house of government died with Samson. Just like Jesus said, he began to deliver Israel. And we listen to Samson's last words. He said, let me die with the Philistines. He bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. And it's almost like we get to the end of verse 30, and, and it's like the Lord saying, well, how do I sum up this guy's life? How, how do I say anything about Samson? And God's epitaph was this, so the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. What a thing for the Lord to say. It's almost like the Lord said, you know, there could have been so many different stories stories here. There could have been so many great victories here. God did something for Samson that he certainly did for no other human that has ever lived. This Samson story should have been very different, but when it comes to the end, it's almost like the Lord says, what can I say? At least when the guy died, he accomplished something. Kind of back in the days of the Civil War, a representative, a state representative from Pennsylvania went to meet Abraham Lincoln. And for hours, he tried to convince Abraham Lincoln to get rid of General Grant. He had a big, long list of things. He said, Ulysses Grant is a drunkard. He had a lot of things to say, and, and you really couldn't argue with a lot of them, I suppose. And, and Abraham Lincoln was awfully good at listening. He's just a tremendous listener. He sat there, and it was like 11 o'clock at night when the representative showed up, and, and he went hour after hours explaining to President Lincoln why Ulysses Grant should no longer be the general leading the northern troops. And when it was all said and done, Abraham Lincoln thought about what he had heard, and he nodded his head a little bit, and he said these words. Well, at least he fights. And you know, it's almost like the Lord in verse number 30 he's kind of stopped for a little bit, and not that the Lord's ever short for words, but it's almost like, what can I say about this guy? I mean, what could have been said about Samson is a lot, but it seems like the Lord can only say, if nothing else, at least he fights. The rest of Israel wouldn't fight. At least Samson found a way. What a sad, sad story. And when it's all said and done, as that building comes crashing down and the dust begins to rise and all that rubble and all that disaster and all that catastrophe, there lies the body of a man whose story could have been very, very, very different. And now Samson's getting the bill for the haircut. He's going to have to pay a price he doesn't want to pay. When the bill comes due, his strength is gone. When the bill comes due, the presence of the Lord is gone. When the bill comes due, his eyes are gone. His self-respect is gone. And now his life is gone. It seems like sin took Samson a little further than he wanted to go. It seems like he has to pay a price. He didn't want to pay. And you know, that's the thing about a revival meeting like this because it really doesn't matter if it's some young person in this room tonight, a teenager, a boy or girl. It doesn't matter if it's one of us older grandparents here tonight. There are no exceptions to the rule in this building tonight. From preacher to young man to young lady, no one is an exception to the rule. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And it is by the mercies of God that you and I are in this building tonight. And if you sit in this place, nobody else has to know. But if you and the Lord know that down here, God is dealing with sin tonight. And God is saying, you need to get this right. And you need to confess that sin. And you need to find mercy. And you need to get this thing dealt with. Well, then tonight, a man, a woman, a boy, or a girl's got a great choice to make. Because tonight we can find our way to an altar and get down on our knees. We can confess our sins and find God merciful and just to forgive us our sins. And we can walk out of the doors right with God. Or the other option is that we can leave this building tonight hoping that God's going to give us another day. We can deal with our sins here tonight or hope that God doesn't deal with them out there tomorrow. The thing is, in this building tonight, we have a choice. For somebody, by tomorrow, that choice may be gone. It'll always take you further than you want to go. 
You always pay a price you don't want to pay. It doesn't matter how pretty the bowl and it doesn't matter how nice the wrapping. When sin runs its course, it always ends the same way. The wages of sin is death. In 1999, a young man graduated from high school. He was sitting at his kitchen, sitting at his kitchen table. On the table in front of him was a piece of paper. All he had to do was take his pen and sign his name to that paper, to that contract. And this 18-year-old would be paid $4 million. His name was Josh Hamilton. And Josh Hamilton, baseball scout said, was the second greatest prospect that ever, ever came out of American high schools. Baseball scouts would say the greatest prospect that ever lived was a guy named Alex Rodriguez, but the second greatest was this young man in North Carolina named Josh Hamilton. He signed that contract and he began to play professional baseball. Of course, you make your way through the minor leagues. It didn't take Josh Hamilton very long. He was one step away from playing for the Tampa Bay. Back then, they called them the Devil Rays, the team in Tampa, Florida. One step away at the highest minor leagues when his life would forever change. Josh Hamilton wrote a book called Beyond Belief. In that book, he described his great potential. He had everything going for him. And one night when a game was over, a teammate named Carl Crawford said to Josh Hamilton, why don't you join me? I'm going down to a tattoo parlor. Josh Hamilton had never been in a tattoo parlor. Can I say, I've never been in a tattoo parlor. I don't see the beauty of it, don't see the desire of it, I just don't see it as an attractive thing. Filling your arm with ink, let alone what the Word of God talks about marking a body, I, I just don't see it as a desirable thing. He said, well, what do I do? What do I do? I got a tattoo. Well, I'll tell you what you do. You just start living for Jesus. That's all right. Like right now, just start living for Jesus. And, and, and I don't see the attraction. I can't say, I guess, that I've never seen a tattoo that I like. There was one, one day. I was preaching in a church not too far from here, and, and it kind of had a raised platform. And right down there in the front was this guy about that big, about that, I mean, you know, one of, one of these Vinny and the Jim type guys. And, and he was sitting kind of right down in front of me, and, and he looked like, as you look at him, the kind of guy you wouldn't want to meet in a dark alley, you know, but, but he was a teddy bear. But right there, on the top of his bald head, he had a huge tattoo of a number 13. Well, that's not a good thing. He had been in his past a part of the M13 gangs in Los Angeles, the most violent gangs in America. And uh, you don't get a tattoo on your head like that unless you've done some pretty horrific things. And yet in a jailhouse, he heard the gospel and the Lord saved him and changed his life. And, and now he is sitting in a local church with the cutest little kids and it's just quite the thing. But you know, when you're standing up here and you're kind of looking down and there's that guy right there and that big old tattoo right there, 13, you really couldn't miss it. And, and one night after the service, we were talking. He said, did you notice this 13 on the top of my head? It's kind of like saying, do you notice the sun when it rises in the morning? Yeah, there's a couple things you don't miss. Yeah, I kind of do. And, and he told me a story how the Lord saved them in jail. But you know what he told me? He said, for the longest time, that 13 was so discouraging to me. Now, now I got to tell you, I, I, I almost tell you never to get a tattoo. And I, I don't know if I've ever seen one I like, but there's this one occasion. He said, when I was shaving in the morning, I'd look in the mirror, and, and every time I saw that 13, I'd remember the old days. I remember the old friends. I remember the old sin. I remember the old ruin. I remember my old life. And I'd start the day so discouraged and so defeated. He said, I couldn't take it anymore. So he said, I went to the tattoo parlor for the last time. He said, I told the guy to put right on top of the 13, Philippians 4. Now it says Philippians 4.13. So what can I tell you? I did see a tattoo that I liked. Just me, just me. But you know, having never gone to a tattoo parlor, what I didn't understand, and yet what Josh Hamilton explained in his book is that it opens up the world uh, to a world that I, I've never been a part of. The tattoo parlor is so connected to the drug culture. It's so connected to everything that we don't want for our lives. It, it, it can lead to a horrible life. The crowd there is not the right kind of crowd. And Josh Hamilton said, I didn't know, but I went to that tattoo parlor. And pretty soon I was going back again and again and again. And he said, it was at that tattoo parlor one night where they invited me to a wild party. He said, I have never gone to a party like this before. Josh Hamilton said, that was the night for the first time in my life I did drugs. The first time in my life I drank liquor. 
The first time in my life I lived in immorality. Stunning how those things all go together, don't they? By the time it was all said and done, Josh Hamilton got the bill for his haircut. He had to pay an incredible price that he didn't want to pay. He lost absolutely everything. Pretty much his own family abandoned him. The only person who didn't was his godly grandmother who kept praying for Josh Hamilton until he got saved. This is how Josh Hamilton wrote it in his book. He said, I was the guy in violation of a contract, a guy willing to take a huge chance with all the talent and a great career. I was the one willing to trade everything I'd worked for for temporary acceptance from a bunch of people that I didn't even know. I'm that one night, with that one moment of weakness, I made a decision that will stay with me for the rest of my life. With that one choice, I embarked on a journey that took me to a place I never could have imagined, where nothing else mattered more than getting a line of drugs. Sin will take you further than you want to go. Sin will make you pay a price you don't want to pay. And as that building comes crashing down on Samson's head, with his last breath, he realizes it's not worth it. Tonight, if you're not saved, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as the only hope for a sinner. Tonight, Pastor Reed wants to have someone open a Bible and let you see from God's Word how a sinner like you and a sinner like me can be saved from sin and have the gift of God, which is eternal life. Tonight, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior, we're sitting in this place with a choice to make. Because we can play the game and pretend like it doesn't matter. We can walk out the door thinking we're the exception to the rule. But there are no exceptions in this place tonight. We can deal with our sin here or hope that God doesn't deal with it out there. Tonight we have a choice. For somebody in this room, by this time tomorrow, they may not have a choice. Payday. Payday's coming. Father in heaven, I ask and pray that tonight you would do a work in this place, in our hearts and in our lives. And, and my Father, I pray that the story of Samson would sound an alarm for men and ladies, for boys and girls and teenagers. And, and oh Lord, help us understand tonight that sin will always bring a price we don't want to pay. In this room tonight, would you do a work that a preacher can't do? For men, ladies, young people, would you bring great conviction? And at this altar, may people deal with sin. For someone without Christ, what a wonderful night to be saved. So we commit the invitation into your hands tonight. Would you stand together with me prayerfully? And, and as we begin to play that invitation song, if God deals in your heart as a Christian tonight at this altar, what a great place to humble ourselves. What a great place to deal with our sins. What a great place to find the one who is merciful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And tonight there is a Savior of mercy. Yet if someone leaves this building tonight and their heart is not right with God, they are taking a gamble for the ages because he's not just there all the time. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, men are at the top of the aisles with Bibles. And, and tonight we'd invite you to step out and come. And if you'd make your way to the front and meet one of them, they, we've got a man or a lady ready to sit down with the Word of God and show you how to be saved. And so tonight the invitation's for you. The invitation's for me. We've got a choice to make. We can deal with our sin here. Or God can deal with it out there. Brother Addison sings that verse for us, and God deals in your heart. Would you come tonight? Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me.
just play that verse again and people pray tonight or somebody else? How many verses have to remind us there's still wages to sin and the soul that sinneth shall surely die? And if nothing else, Samson serves as a reminder to you and a reminder to me that one day, no matter who you are, there's a bill due. And it'll always cost more than you want to pay. It'll always bring you to a place you don't want to go. We have choices to make. So with the dust rising from a Philistine house of religion, all we can do is watch the Lord shake his head and say, the dead he slew in his death were more than they slew in his life. What a disgraceful, sad ending to a story that didn't have to be. Thank you so much for that <clears throat> message tonight, Brother Swank. You can go and be seated. and. <clears throat> We can ask our ushers to go and prepare for our love offering tonight. And just want to remind you that um, let's make sure that we are doing our part to be a blessing to the Schwankies. And what I don't have to remind you about, about is uh, how Brother Schwanky is always a blessing to us by just being faithful to preach the Word of God. And... Um, Thank you, gentlemen. Let's have a word of prayer and ask the Lord to, to bless the love offering this evening. Our Father, we come to you thanking you for the message that we've heard tonight. And, and Lord, I pray that no matter how small we might think the sin is, Lord, in front of the eyes of a holy God, there is no small sin. And whether it be anger or, or bitterness or lack of patience or something that we do that we shouldn't, something that we say that we shouldn't, something that we look at that we shouldn't, something that we listen to that we shouldn't, whatever it might be. Lord, I pray that you would help us to humble ourselves before you and take care of it. And Lord, I pray that you would just help us to genuinely show our appreciation for a man that is willing to stand up and open up the Word of God and preach it just like it says. Lord, he's a blessing to us not just because of who he is, but, Lord, because of the message that he preaches from your word. And we thank you for it. I pray that you'd help us to, to be a blessing to him. In Jesus' name, amen.